Joseph gave them enough food to last them till the two-year point of the famine. Israel didn't know the details, but he knew in his heart of hearts. All this wrong had come about somehow due to the chicanery of his sons. He surrenders the destiny of his family into the hands of El Shaddai. We can only imagine what Joseph thought when he saw Benjamin. The brothers automatically see the lunch invitation as the harbinger of their doom. The Hebrew brothers sat in the most lavish house they'd ever seen, and into the room walked the most impressive, powerful and frightening man they'd ever seen, their faces planted in fear firmly against the floor. Joseph had to hastily flee from the room where he wept in private for the joy of seeing his baby brother again. The brothers had eyes, but they didn't see. They had ears, but they didn't understand. Genesis 43 verse 1. Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had bought from Egypt, that their father said to them, go back, buy us a little food. You see, Joseph had full knowledge. He knew the famine would not be complete till seven years had passed. His brothers had come to him probably about a year into the famine, not knowing how much longer the famine would last. Joseph gave them enough food to last them till the two-year point of the famine. Joseph could play the longer game, understanding time was on his side and knowing they'd have to return for more. As Joseph's first supply dwindled, with no sign of the famine relenting, everyone in the house of Israel could see the time was fast approaching. Yet no one said anything, till Jacob sheepishly asks his sons, buy us a little food, just a morsel. Jacob was probably starting to dream about a mouthful of fresh bread to eat. You know, when you're really hungry and start imagining the taste of your favourite food? That's how the entire house of Israel was feeling at this point. Verse 3. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Reuben, the eldest, has lost respect in the house of Israel. He'd been in charge on the two separate occasions. Jacob lost a son. Reuben has also committed adultery with Jacob's concubine, destroying his relationship with his father and brothers. So it's understandable Reuben doesn't speak now on behalf of the brothers. Simeon, the secondborn, is lost in Egypt. But it isn't the thirdborn Levi who steps forward. It's the fourthborn Judah a natural leader of the brothers who speaks, the one who proposed Joseph's sale into slavery, the one who acted wickedly in Genesis 38 with Tamar. So Judah was a natural leader, but a dreadful person with a very dark and ugly history. But he has the strength of character to say no to his father. The only way we go to Egypt is if Benjamin comes with us. Verse 6, And Israel said, Why did you deal so wrongfully with me, as to tell the man whether you had still another brother? But they said, The man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him, according to these words, Could we possibly have known that he would say, Bring your brother down? Notice the text now declares, Israel spoke. Jacob sheepishly requested a morsel in verse 2. But now we hear the man previously known as Jacob boldly declare as the new man Israel, the relentless wrestler with God, voices his disapproval of his sons. Israel didn't know the details, but he knew in his heart of hearts all this wrong had come about somehow due to the chicanery of his sons. These sons of Israel were a constant source of problem and drama for Jacob. But what Jacob fails to realise, he's raised his boys to be just like Papa. They're each as devious and twisted as Jacob, the usurper, the heel grabber, the deceiver, the beguiling one. Verse 8. Then Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, 
that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned this second time. Judah spells out the obvious to his father. We'll all die if we don't return to Egypt. We have no choice. Benjamin must come with us. Judah offers himself as surety, but it's hardly a hero's offer. If the brothers fail to return from Egypt with food, all is lost for the extended family of Israel. Judah also points out, the fact we've delayed this long in returning makes us look guilty as charged before the Egyptians. We were instructed to bring our youngest brother back immediately as proof of our innocence. Our long lingering, our delay in returning to Egypt, has already compromised the integrity of our account before the governor. Verse 11. And the father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise, go back to the man, and may God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. Again, notice the name Israel is used in verse 11. He uses the same tactic he employed when placating the anger of Esau, his brother. Sending gifts to Esau immediately before the 20-year reunion as recorded in Genesis 32, they obviously had some small supplies of luxury edibles, including honey, spices, nuts, and probably dried fruits. But the food cabinets were all but empty. This is the last roll of the dice for Israel. Israel is resigned to his fate. If his sons fail on this mission, he loses Benjamin. But the lack of food and severity of the famine would see him soon starve if they did nothing. He surrenders the destiny of his family into the hands of El Shaddai, literally God Almighty, the very place God wanted Israel to stand, the same place God wants us to stand in total dependence on him. Verse 15, So the men took that present and Benjamin and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt. And they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my home, and slaughter an animal, and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Once again, when the sons of Israel arrived at the front of the grain line, Joseph was diligently working at the coalface. Joseph was probably the hardest worker of the elites of Egypt. He's the governor of Egypt, the vice-regent, second only to Pharaoh, and yet he's a man who rolls up his sleeves. Joseph is just as likely to be handling the money exchange on basic grain transactions as presenting a monthly report to Pharaoh. I imagine him to be the first one arrived at the selling line in the morning and the last one to depart in the evening. He wasn't the type to sit in penthouses and receive a biased report from an agenda-driven frontline worker. He didn't need others to report frontline details to him as he worked the frontline himself. He had the pulse of the nation. He knew from first-hand experience what was going on. I'd also like to speculate. Joseph had calculated the family of Israel would be about out of food by now and therefore paying special attention to the people in the grain lines looking out for his brothers. Well, today was the day. The sons of Israel arrived. Ten men amongst thousands that day, and Joseph was right there to see them arrive. We can only imagine what Joseph thought when he saw Benjamin. Last time he saw him, he was only a toddler. Maybe he recognised his mother's eyes and his father's jawline. I can't imagine having the discipline Joseph will display in keeping his identity a secret. The ten brothers would be privileged to lunch with the vice-regent. 
for the average person. An unbelievable joy and experience. What a privilege. But for men with a guilty conscience, an experience to have you quaking in your boots. Joseph was a stickler for working hours. A wonderful example for all to work hard and not slack off. His time with his brothers will have to wait for the 12 noon lunchtime break. Verse 18. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, It is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in, so that he may make a case against us and seize us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. <laughs> this verse, read in the authorised, always makes me chuckle, revealing my juvenile nature. But you read verse 18 in the authorised. <laughs> Verse 19, when they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. But it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack. Our money in full weight. So we have bought it back in our hand and we have bought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. The brothers automatically see the lunch invitation to the governor's house as the harbinger of their doom. Verse 23, but he said, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water. And they washed their feet and he gave their donkeys feed. Then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there. Joseph's household steward offers a kindly greeting of peace to the Israelites. Shalom for the Hebrew boys. As far as I can tell, this is the first time this Hebrew greeting is offered in the Bible. A Hebrew greeting repeated billions of times since this first day, circa 1925 BC in northern Egypt. The steward also calms their fears regarding the earlier money mix-up. Every sin is accounted for. The God of your father has blessed you with your treasure. This same steward was probably the one who oversaw the earlier return of the money to the brothers. The return of Simeon to them unharmed, plus the kindly treatment of feet washing and donkey feeding, certainly helped calm their worst fears. And now they were to have lunch with the vice regent of Egypt. What in the world is going on, they wondered. They would have still been petrified. Verse 26. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. Then he asked them about their well-being and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. The Hebrew brothers sat in the most lavish house they'd ever seen, the most opulent household furnishings they'd ever witnessed. And into the room walked the most impressive, powerful and frightening man they'd ever seen, the vice regent of Egypt, the world superpower. Why does this ruler want to have lunch with us lowly foreigners? Joseph enters. They meekly offer their dried fruits, nuts and honey, which sounded like a good idea when their father suggested it. But now as they hand over the gifts surrounded by the opulence of Egypt, it seemed like an unworthy offering to such a mighty man as this. As they hand the vice regent the gift, their faces planted in fear firmly against the floor, bowing exactly as Joseph had dreamed, with the eleven sheaves bowing before him, as recorded in Genesis 37. They must have wondered, why is this Egyptian so interested about our family and the well-being of our father? Why is he so fixated on us? As they prostrated themselves a second time. Verse 29. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? He knew it was. He could see the resemblance. Even though Joseph knew, he couldn't believe it. Is this really my baby brother? My mama's little boy? Joseph had steeled himself to continue the secret still a little longer. 
But his emotions quickly came to the surface upon seeing Benjamin face to face, man to man. He was right before him. He could reach out and hug him. But that would demand he break character. And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out. And he restrained himself and said, Serve the bread. Joseph had to hastily flee from the room where he wept in private for the joy of seeing his baby brother again. Having washed his face and composed himself, Joseph continued his role as vice-regent, disguised from his brothers in plain sight. The brothers had eyes, but they didn't see. They had ears, but they didn't understand. This was their brother right before them. I wonder if at any point any of them had any sense of the familiar as they looked on the vice regent. Verse 32. So they set him a place by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. Then he took servings to them from before him. But Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and were merry with him. Now let's unpack these last verses of our study today. Joseph, still disguised from his brothers, couldn't eat at the same table as his brothers, as this would have looked bad to his other Egyptian luncheon guests. For someone to eat, with these 11 sheep-herding, goat-hugging, Hebrew hillbillies was a defiling abomination. Completely unthinkable, something not seen in the lands of Egypt. You may as well eat from a leper's hand as have lunch with these 11 brothers. But Joseph's Egyptian luncheon guests, probably the senior managers in his grain administration, couldn't eat with Joseph either, as although Joseph spoke Egyptian, wore Egyptian clothing, was married to an Egyptian, and was vice-regent of all Egypt. The Egyptian luncheon guests knew Joseph was also a Hebrew. Maybe not a hillbilly Hebrew like these 11 filthy goat huggers, but a Hebrew nonetheless. So Joseph ate alone. His brothers probably assuming the vice-regent was above eating with his Egyptian staff. One final shocker for the sons of Israel. They're seated at the luncheon table in accordance with their birthright. The ten older brothers are all aged between 39 and 46. Benjamin is in his mid to early 20s. There was no way possible the vice regent of Egypt could have known the ages of these brothers. These sons of Israel had entered the twilight zone 3,900 years before the TV show was invented. And they also enjoyed the greatest meal of their life this afternoon. They drank and were merry before the Egyptian governor. And Benjamin was favoured with a five-fold supply. Until our next study, may the God of rich blessings abundantly bless you all.